Good morning again, everybody. Uh, today's reading is from Swamiji's, uh, oops, here, just a minute. I'll do it. Rays of the One Light, and this is based on Master's teachings. The following readings are from the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. Each week we read from both scriptures as prescribed by Yoganandaji and by his guru, Sri Yukteswarji who was guided by Babaji to compare the two scriptures to show the same underlying truths between them. This week is called How Devotees Rise. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Last week, we asked the question, although, did we ask the question? We, we, didn't ask the question. we didn't ask the question, but the question was, why do devotees fall? And we considered the downfall of Judas in this context, uh, who was the disciple of Jesus that betrayed him at the end that caused him to be killed, murdered. <laughs> uh, uh, and then Mary, uh, who was a devotee, of uh, Christ, she was very devoted to him. And uh, because she he was her guru, uh, she would do things like give him foot massages and try to bring comfort to him. So she went ahead and was putting some oils on his feet, but the oils were rather expensive. And so uh, Judas, who, you know, the one who betrayed him, felt as though Christ wasn't doing his job the right way. You know, it would be like if Yoganandaji had a disciple that said, you could be more popular if you do this or if you do that, rather than Yoganandaji following his guidance from the divine mother and father. So this was the same story for Christ as well. He had this critical devotee that ended in uh, his death. But the devotee in the end didn't even expect that his actions would cause this. And after he caused his death, he ran and killed himself. So it was all a big misunderstanding. This guy was so egoic, he felt his way was the right way. And so he was constantly critical of the guru who was completely in touch with God's will. And so, Anyway, in this story, uh, um, uh, Judas started to criticize Mary Magdalene for using this oil. And he said, the poor always uh, to use this oil. But then um, Christ said to Judas in response to his criticism about it, he said, the poor always ye have with you, but me you have not always. So Christ is saying here that there's one supreme injustice that needs eradication, poverty, yes, but not of a material kind, poverty in a spiritual sense. Divine blessings are not common in this world. They are extraordinary. When they come, we should give them priority above every other consideration. Never allow a moment of inner joy, for instance, to be set aside for lesser duties divine attunement to our highest priority. As Lahiri Mahashaya, the guru of Yoganandaji's guru said, to listen to the heart's inner sound, Om, which issues from the very center of our being, is man's highest duty. Mary Magdalene on this occasion was not communing in inner silence with Christ's spirit as she had been with Martha, who urged Christ to reproach her for not helping out in the kitchen. This is another story that happened. Mary this time was serving outwardly, but in a very different spirit from the restless fussing. Those who see a radical difference between the paths of action and meditation should understand this distinction. To serve in the right spirit is necessary. So to serve, whether it's inwardly or outwardly, one has to have the right spirit. For only thereby we can overcome our karmic tendencies toward restless activity. The important thing is that spirit be always inwardly focused. 
that in everything we do, whether inwardly or outwardly, we do act in loving service to God. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita says in the third chapter, the state of freedom from action, that is of eternal rest in the spirit, cannot be achieved without action. No one by mere renunciation and outward involvement can attain perfection. Whenever the spirit of God descends upon you, however, remember the words of Christ, me ye have not always with you. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh, oh, oh. This reading is from Whispers from Eternity by Paramahansa Yogananda, Book of Prayer Poems. This is let all rest in the shade of my peace. <clears throat> the breeze of thy love wafts through me, O Father. Leaves of my tree of life tremble gently in response to thy coming. My soul blossoms have begun to awaken. The rustling murmur of my thought leaves, whispering in the ether, calls to all matter-weary beings to come and rest in the shade of my peace received from thee. It's a wonderful pair of readings and topics that we have, how devotees, uh, why do devotees fall and how devotees rise. And uh, in a way this year, for, for whatever reason, we didn't do that um, reading because we had Jyotishji and Deviji, and maybe it was merciful because when we say this week's reading is how do devotees fall, everyone kind of goes, <laughs> and then sort of the whole time is just sort of sitting on the edge of their seat. This we sort of snuck it in. How devotees rise and they also fall. And so sort of like, okay, well, so you get both the good news and the other news at the same time. This, this uh, example uh, states it so clearly and you know it's wonderful to have um, for example the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita because it's it's so helpful how they they both shed light on the same truth and in the same way but in some in some situation many situations we see all the truth uh, the sameness of the truth this the similarity of the truth it's one truth but different angles, different facets. And sometimes there are stories or points that are brought out clearly in one that are also mentioned in the other. But this story of the attitude of the devotee, of course, there are so many in India as well, is just so clear. So as Darmini was saying, um, one of uh, Jesus's most devoted disciples, again, he was her guru, she was uh, covering his feet with a costly oil. And the uh, and Judas said, seemingly to be sort of, you know, altruistic or virtuous, why instead was this oil not sold for money and then the money given to the poor? And, you know, you could say, well, I mean, maybe this is actually something that comes up in devotees' minds. Like, should I seek my own comfort or should I invest in this or should we just, you know, use it all to help others? And you have to balance it. The answer isn't always the same. One thing you do have to remember is you have to keep yourself going. You know, maybe not in a limousine, but you have to keep yourself going. Be, and that is a responsibility too that we have to make because if we're not going, if we are no longer going, then we can't help anybody also. So we have to keep our own engine running. That's important. And so, you know, this, you, you think at this story and so long ago and in some other place and so on, you know what that costly oil was? Spikenard is the English word. Do you know the Tamil or the Sanskrit word? Jadamamsi. So suddenly, oh, Jadamamsi, you know, maybe Ashwagandha too. And, you know, it's sort of like, oh, well, we, we know that. And so that's what she was using. So you know, again, it's amazing to see all the, again, similarities, as I said, at the center of it all. So the two attitudes of the devotee, one just saying, I'm offering myself to you. And I'm also, you know, it, it, hers was an act of devotion. 
And you could even say without reason or beyond reason, not without reason, beyond reason. Whereas Judas's reason, which could have been good, was critical. Because as Darmini explained, he tended to have a critical eye that the guru was good, but you know, he could be better and I could help him. You see? And so how devotees rise? First thing, don't do that. But the thing is that the, the message Swamiji reiterated in the reading that you just heard was when you have inspiration, when inspiration comes, hang on to it. Don't just say, okay, this is fine and I'm inspired, but now I'll always be inspired and now I can do everything else. The, the, it's so helpful, this message, the, the poor you have always with you, but me you have not always. And it's not the poor uh, materially. It's it, you could in the context of what that story was, it made sense for Jesus to say that, but it's it's even people who are spiritually poor, but it's not even people, it's ourselves. Our our spiritually poor thoughts we have with us always. They're always there. So when they say, This is really inspiring, but I would also like a plate of Italy, and I think I'm gonna stop now and go make it, you can make it, or you can even order it in, on Swiggy so you can meditate longer. You know, in other words, work with yourself to hang on to that inspiration. Don't take it for granted. Now, of course, when we are transfixed with some vision of Babaji, or if we meditate and we just feel peace and relief from whatever stress has been troubling us, it's easy. It's easy to stay in that state. You don't want to leave it. And when we have been meditating long enough, meanings in like suppose a half an hour or 45 minutes i'm not trying to give a number but i mean long enough in duration of one particular meditation it may not be that there's some big uh aha or some big boom but there's just a stillness that sneaks in and then we don't want to leave that because of the peace so again it's easy in that time if someone says don't leave that peace you say don't worry i'm not going anywhere i'm just here so a corollary of this, when a blessing comes, don't take it for granted, hang on to it, is when a blessing doesn't come, seek it, you know, because you could say, well, I'm following the rules, I have no inspiration, and so I have nothing to leave, and so I might as well do everything. Seek inspiration. One person described the spiritual path, they said, we have to do CPR, a constant process of re-inspiration. We have, that's what meditation is. It's constantly feeding ourselves. That's what, if, you, if that doesn't make sense, think of food. You know, you say, well, I won't have lunch because I had breakfast. I won't have dinner because I had dinner yesterday. No one will think that. No one sane, of course. And so I'm saying, if we have particular enthusiasm for food, just to say, no, you have to keep yourself going. And so the same thing with meditation, with devotion, with these things, we have to keep ourselves going. We have to feed ourselves. And this is how we rise. If you go without food for too long, you do not rise. You sink permanently. And so you have to keep on to keep the engine going, as I was saying before. So in the same way, we have to feed ourselves in these different ways. And it's, it's so important because there are sort of different phases that people go through. You could say, well, how do devotees rise in the beginning? Devotees rise in the beginning by becoming devotees. You see? In other words, the first step on the spiritual path is to enter the spiritual path, to, you know, uh, hear about a meditation class and take that or find a spiritual book that really grips you or find... 10 spiritual books as part of an exploration until you find, okay, this connects with me the best. So in this, I want to go deep. It's a little bit like going to school or college and picking a subject that you particularly resonate with. Hopefully that's how it's picked as opposed to being assigned when you were an LKG that you will do medicine. But uh, that, <laughs> that you, you say, this fits me, this suits me, this interests me, this also I have some knack for or interest in, who cares if I have a knack, I'm going to do it. Swamiji's mother uh, coined the phrase, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. 
meaning who cares if you're good at something or not, if you enjoy it, just do it. She said this because she had been an expert violinist and it also brought her great joy. And then she injured her hand and unfortunately she had a surgery which damaged her hand in a certain way further and she could no longer hold, I don't know if it was the strings or the bow in the right way. And so she couldn't play anymore. But at the end of her life, she started playing anyway. And she said, who cares if how it sounds? And Swamiji said, believe me, it, it didn't sound all that great, but she loved doing it. And so she wasn't self-conscious about whether it was uh, pleasing to others, it was pleasing her. And there was, and really that's all that matters. There was another woman who met Master. She became his disciple. And on just on the first meeting, she went into a kind of samadhi that lasted several days. And this is speaking of off-key music. She went to a concert with her friends, and she herself was a very uh, sort of, I don't know if she was a musician, but she had a very refined ear. She could hear, you know, this note is right or not. And she heard these inexperienced people playing who they didn't even tune their instruments together. And you hear that when, they, when the sounds don't go together, it's an automatic clash. She said, oh, they're playing so beautifully. And her friends kind of looked at each other, sort of as, what, has she gone deaf? But in from God's point of view and from her uplifted state at the time, she just saw the joy, the beauty behind it. And so we have to uh, always be seeking ways to fill ourselves up, to feed ourselves, and to rise. The easiest way to rise is to spend time in one way or another. Once you've found a spiritual path, because I was saying, find a spiritual path that you like so you can go deep. Because you can't go deep in everything. You, you say, how many, how many majors? You can have a major and a minor in college. You say, I have 10 majors. Somebody gets away with double or every now and then you hear about some 10-year-old who's a triple major or some you know, amazing prodigy. But most of us have one. And so in this case, too, spiritually, we go deep in one path. Because you can't go deep in many. You don't have the time. And so to really go deep then we spend more time with the guru what how is the guru uh, what is that word translated as in two ways one is guru gu space ru remover of darkness yes but the other is gore u that which lifts you and so how do devotees rise you see where i'm going with this <laughs> it is the guru who lifts us and it's so easy to experience. We may be sitting at home, we may be in a state of non-inspiration and say, the thought may come, let me read something. I'll read autobiography of a yogi. No, 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 Vaindam. And then you work with yourself because it is, is it your soul? Is it that divine part of you that says, I don't want to feel more, more spiritual? No. Is it your heart that says, I'm tired of peace, I've had so much peace, I'm sick of it? No, it is the mind. The mind is going, nah. I would rather play, or I would rather sit here and be dull, or I don't feel like whatever. And so we can work with our mind instead of saying, you're horrible, don't. That doesn't work. Master said, you know, you don't, don't you know, uh, if you have a donkey that you're trying to move along, and it refuses to move, you don't hit it with a stick and you don't scold it and you don't, you know, in other ways, try to make it move. It'll just stay even more still, very stubborn. But if you just leave it, then after a while, it'll sort of get bored and wonder what's over there and start moving. And so sometimes you have to work with your mind that way. Give it a little bit of time to just go and uh, rebel or whatever, and then negotiate. Say, I, you know, Ada, on the post on the post come bend them. They say, okay, what about just one page? Hmm. Half a page. Okay, <laughs> half a page. Hmm. You open the book to half a page, and maybe the first sentence, <gasps> you know, suddenly something comes in. Again, it's just like feeding ourselves. And we seek that all the time, that I can't just sit and um, like a plant and make my own food. I have to feed myself. And so again, spiritually, I may be hungry, but it doesn't mean I reach, I know what's good for me. I, but if we feel that blah, just negotiate. I'll, I'll just have a little. 
And reading that for the first sentence of autobiography, it says one of the characteristic features of Indian culture is the a search for eternal verities, meaning eternal truths, eternal, and the concomitant disciple guru relationship, concomitant meaning the sort of resulting or necessary. If you're looking for eternal truths, you have to enter into the disciple guru relationship. Why? Because a true guru is one with God. And so he or she can give you that same power, that magnetism. It's much more than just information. You, you can learn from a professor and say, he is one with civil engineering. But <laughs> actually, in addition to intellectually, a professor, anyone who's passionate about something, also their magnetism, their enthusiasm affects us too. We become enthusiastic with that in their aura or just sort of by their energy, we get drawn into it. So magnetism works on many levels, but the highest level is that of the guru that his love for God, his power of knowing God, he that raises us, it lifts us. And it's so easy in the sense that it's always within reach. And so the, it's important to, to continue to find ways and new ways. For example, we could, um, at one time at Ananda Village's history, they were uh, meeting to sort of discuss how can we take things deeper? How, again, how can we re-inspire? It's not that people weren't inspired, but you have to always kind of come up with new angles, new things, new classes, new activities, just to keep it fresh, all on the same path, all in the same direction, but ways of, again, uh, spicing it up, because that's what happens. We first get on the path, and we're learning and everything is new. And at a certain point for everyone, we, we get into a period which is, involves sometimes a bit of slogging. I'm not saying that the spiritual path is fun at the beginning, then a bunch of slogging work and I hope you find God at the end. I don't know, I'm still trying, I'm still slogging. No, sometimes that's how it's expressed and it is not that. There is a lot of joy. There's a lot of peace. I laughed out loud last week, which I shouldn't have, at a question that was asked. This person asked Jyotishji and Devi Ji, I have worked so hard and I've spent so much time on the spiritual path and I am just where I started. And I laugh because it's not true. All you have to do is go back mentally to a year ago, well, 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, 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 of six months ago, whenever you started and think, try to remember how we actually were then. And for many people, we were miserable, or we were restless, or we were stressed all the time, or we were irritated all the time by everything that everyone else was doing. And if they would just behave, I would be fine. All these things, it's amazing to see, even within a week of meditation, how people start to shift. On the one hand, they're growing. On the one hand, they're rising. On another, hand, on another level, you could say they're healing. In other words, they're becoming whole. We're becoming who we really are. We're letting go of some things that we have either picked up or we have seen others do. I, I had to work this out. I, I somehow it hit me one, at one time that if you really, if you follow the spiritual path, you'll basically be happy all the time or at least calm all the time. And I thought, but that's not possible. You can't be calm all the time. I mean, it's, I don't even know if it's healthy. You, there should be a little bit of irritation and anger. Statistically, I don't think so. But I realized that, for example, speaking of the guru, I, that's what Swamiji always said about master. He was always in himself, centered, always appropriate. He wasn't withdrawn into himself. You would say, would, would you like something to eat? I am in the self. Meister Pak, huh? Oh, maybe. No. And Swamiji, we did see ourselves uh, in, you know, and you can see him yourself on any video on YouTube. He was always that way. He was centered. That Even when he was talking about a serious thing, that, I mean, a, a stressful thing, he was centered. Even if he was... Uh, talking about an agitating thing, and maybe he felt a little agitated. He would say that, I felt a little uptight, or I felt a little agitated. My God, it was way calmer than anybody else. And I, I don't know how much I, I really know if he felt agitated. That's what he said, if only perhaps to relate to us. But also, again, for each soul, they make this journey. 
Master said any avatar who comes to earth, descends to earth, as the word means, is one that fought this battle already and became free. And so we saw Swamiji fighting that. In fact, he went not fighting it at the time we saw. I think he had fought and won already. But I say this because he told the story of a struggle that he had in doubting master. This was a real spiritual test for him. And remember, how do devotees rise? They meet their tests and they pass them, which is to say they survive them. <laughs> Sometimes we have tests that keep knocking us down and we think, oh my God, I'm never going to pass this or each day I'm failing, but you're still here. You see? So you are passing. Your master said tests should be met pleasantly. It was Sri Yukteswar I said, because you just say, oh, guess what? There's some karma to work out. Do I have some karma? Self-evidently, everybody has some karma and this is how I'm working out some of mine. Fine. Sometimes it's a lesson that needs to be learned. Oh, I should not do this anymore. Oh, I should do that. Sometimes it's just, can you stay as calm as possible? Possible. You can say, okay, good. Because it means, as one person said to me, oh, in my house, there is so much shouting. And I said, I'm so sorry. She said, yes, I do most of the shouting. <laughs> I said, okay, here's an idea. Um, but so we, but again, maybe, maybe we reduce the shouting to just, you know, six hours a day down from 12 or something. In other words, think of it as progress. I'm calmer, than I used to be. I'm feeling more devotion than I used to. I can handle this stress for 30 seconds more than I used to before I just say, ah. you see, we have to look at it as progression. We have to take it a step at a time. If we think to leap all the way to the end, well, uh, it doesn't work. Swamiji said there was one monk uh, living with them at master's time, and he would often not do anything. He's sort of, eh, sadhana, and he would just sort of be casual. Um, but then every now and then he would be seized with deep spiritual inspiration, and he would uh, come up with a schedule of how he was going to spend each day in maximum spirituality. You know, 8 o'clock, chant, 8.05, pray, 8.09, then go back to meditation. And he would publish the schedule on his door of his room, and he would look and all the rest of the monks is just sort of, my God, that, that's what you're doing. Did you, did you happen to see my schedule? And Swamiji said it would last, you know, a day or two. And he said, and when he fell, he fell far. Because again, we if we try to swing too much this way, it ends up having to swing that way. Again, the way to win is to survive, <laughs> is to still be here. Now, there's much more than survival. I don't mean that we're still here. Master said that. He said, those who go on to the end, they will have God. And that means on to the end of life, for one thing. So whether we have God, he did say, I or one of the other masters, those who stick to this path to the end, I or one of the other masters, will bring them, help them make the crossing over at the time of death. It's a wonderful promise. But he also, in one of his talks, he says, those who hang on to the end, not for sticking it out. Not just that, look, I'm here till the end, so you have to. You know, there's that story of if you die in, in Varanasi, then you'll automatically be liberated. So there was this one thief who heard about this and thought, that's good. So at the near the end of his life, he moved to Varanasi, and then he, I, he, they say he cut off his own legs. You know, I'm sure that's not that easy to do. Maybe he hired somebody. Anyway, the point is, he cut off his legs, so he just said, now I can't ever leave Varanasi. And so I'm guaranteed to die and be liberated for no good reason, but just that I'm here. And so uh, he he did this for some time and he was begging or whatever he did. And then uh, I don't think he could thieve much anymore because it'd be pretty easy to catch. But um, <laughs> the, the, then some some young guy came riding past him on a horse and he was hardly keeping his balance and the horse was not obeying him. And this this man said, you know, he said, you're such a bad horse rider. He said, even I with no legs could ride a horse better than you. And so the man said, yeah. And so he got off and he hoisted this man onto the horse and the horse got, got scared by something and took off and ran right outside the city and threw the guy. And anyway, he hit his head and 
merged in not God, but somewhere he left. So, you know, you just can't escape these things. You can't just, there's no freebie, but there is a lot of help. They say uh, 90% of success is just showing up or something like that. There's some, maybe I got the percentage wrong, meaning try to be in the right place at the right time and it just helps or just take enough, put out enough energy to start. Like I said, a half page of autobiography of a yogi. I will. I don't feel like watching a spiritual YouTube video, but I will negotiate. So sort by duration least to greatest okay i will watch a 30 second video 30 seconds short of something so you 30 seconds that song that we heard you know we all arrived in this temple in different states of mind and we had the chanting that helped us begin but just that song i was reflecting on it it's amazing how hearing swamiji's voice hearing the guitar hearing the music hearing the words i love that line Come gather round, let joy sing out today. Dawn now is breaking, and the mountains say, it's only light that makes the darkness run. And this is the line, lift up your head, greet the rising sun. And that's so much of how devotees rise, how we rise is we just lift up our head. You know, even just, I'm sad about something, I'm depressed, I'm feeling miserable. And just to lift up the head to look at the picture of Swamiji that's nearby, or lift up your head to look at the autobiography of a yogi that you have, or just even say, God, can you help? Once I prayed, God, I know nothing can be done, but it would be nice. That Because I couldn't say, God, I know you can help me, because I was so sort of down in the dumps about the situation and so stressed about it. I didn't think God could do anything, but I mentioned it. And in 24 hours, God solved the whole thing. It was amazing to me. It's a different story. But that was the only, that act of just, just that enough, because we open ourselves. You could say, does God sit there and say, I won't help you until, yeah, you got to give me something. At least you could remember me. You could write once in a while. You could call. No, God isn't like that at all. He's, he understands. He loves us. He's with us all the time. That's another thing that helps us to rise is when we remember that, because sometimes in remembering that, thinking it, we feel it. We can get into this weird thought with God that if I don't behave 100% correctly, according to all the things that I know are in the spiritual path, you are displeased. If I said I was going to meditate at 90 minutes today and I didn't, then you will not like me anymore and I'm not worthy to even talk to you. Ridiculous. Again, if you can't meditate 90 minutes, if that's your goal, try to meditate five minutes. In other words, to make it non-zero. We all need to have a backup plan in our sadhana. Now, please don't come away saying, we only have to meditate five minutes. That's what he said. I've had that quoted back to me now a few times. No, you only, you said, and it's official. No, I did not say. I said, backup plan, a choice between zero and non-zero. Let's live for non-zero when we have times of emergency. Why? Because master said, and Swamiji too, the more you meditate, the more you want to meditate. It's that simple. Someone once came to Swamiji and said, some of the people in the community are feeling not inspiration in their meditations. And uh, so there's some discontent and, you know, sort of with this air of a little bit of, you know, just, you know, uh, what's the word? Not, not conspiracy, but crisis. It's a crisis. And she said, so how can we help them? He said, have them meditate more. And she said, oh, just sort of, but it's, he said, he said, yeah. The more you meditate, the more you want to meditate, because so much of what we have to burn through is just a little bit of mud. In other words, you try it. And I say this from personal experience, a little bit of uh, a little bit that might last 10 minutes. And in my case, it has in a three hour meditation, it has lasted two hours and 59 minutes. When is, you know, can someone please chant Om? And then at the last minute, all that mood, all that mud, all that just disappears. 
And I have always sort of wondered if I meditated for a half hour, could it have been 29? Why does it always have to? And it's not always that way. But what's so amazing is, again, it's lift up your head, greet the rising sun. You lift up, I'm greeting the clouds. I'm greeting the gray sky. But if you wait long enough, it, the sun comes out. I mean, I don't mean just wait long enough. I mean, keep doing, keep trying. And so the other thing too is to have fun. Have fun with it. The song is fun just because music reaches us. It lifts us. Have fun with other devotees. Have fun again, as I said, watching different YouTube videos. We learn more that way too. There's always some new angle, something. If we're intellectually oriented, the mind gets some new piece of information or new story and so on. But remember, most of all, that God is right here, meaning with you. And so, and he's not with a clipboard kind of going, hmm, and uh, checking pass or fail. He's always with you, always. I mean, listen, if he wants to do pass or fail, we all pass once we're in God, which is to say until then we all, well, never mind. But the point is, he has to adjust his expectations to reality. We're, we're the ones he has to work with. And we have him. So remember, and this is that experience that you feel all alone and suddenly you feel the guru is here. Once that haze clears and you realize, my God, he's been here the whole time. And again, this is a feeling. It's good to affirm. It's good to have intellectually because that gets us there. When that feeling comes, it's very soothing. And we remember, just be in it for the long haul. Like Swamiji said about that monk, he said, we may not have been as sincere as he was in our schedules, but we just kept marching on. We kept plodding on and we kept one foot in front of the other. That's how devotees rise as they take the steps one step at a time and they just keep going. Just remember, you are not doing it alone. Why? Self-evidently, look around, here we are. But reach out for help, reach out in connection, especially you may live in a house of devotees. And uh, uh, if so, as Swamiji said, we are all very jealous. But if you don't, if you are the only one uh, who's seeking spiritually seriously in this way, then mix with others in your, in your spiritual family. As one of the devotees here was say, he was leaving to come to the center, and his his uh, his son said to him, "Are you going to visit your other family?" And so feel that connection that you have. Of course, your own family, you have your spiritual family of devotees, and and call upon that help either directly by talking to someone or just by coming here and being together. The magnetism is very helpful. The magnetism that each one of us brings that we all bring together helps all of us too. Because the guru is with you, the guru is with you, the guru is with you. And so there's what, you know, 30 gurus or 40 gurus in here, 30 copies of master or whoever of the masters here. Blessing all of us. Okay. And remember, we're all in it together. We're all taking our steps together. There's not some, you know, hierarchy or weird thing it's we're all just putting one foot in front of the other to make it to the end in god in joy god bless